Welcome. I'm calling the meeting to order at uh, 6.02 p.m. Jessica, would you please perform the roll call? Yes. So we have um, Joe Pishinary. Here. Here. Mary Lind. Here. Michael Bean. Here. Issa Avion. Present. Present. Okay. Martin. Jack, I'm here. Terry um, Dillon. I'm here. Johnny Kirshenman. Present. Jenna McCauley. Here. Hi. And Eric Adams. All right. Okay, roll call is complete. Thank you. Request for any input on prior meetings. Any changes? Motion to approve the minutes if there are no changes. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes from last time. Okay. Okay. Next on the agenda is business from the audience. Public testimony will be received during business from the audience. As a reminder, the meeting is being recorded. The committee will listen to your comments and will not respond to public comment until the committee response portion of the meeting agenda. Meeting minutes will be taken by the staff and forwarded to the city manager and city council members of the public. If the, of the public can always send writing written testimony to the committee or city council. As we begin our meeting tonight, I would last, like to ask the members of the audience to please keep yourself on mute until you're called to provide public testimony. Public testimony will allow speakers two minutes each for a total of 20 minutes. If you're joining us online with a tablet, smartphone, or computer and wish to speak at either of, those either of those times, please use the question window to make a request. Please identify your, your self, name, address, Springfield Ward member, and the subject you'd like to speak about. You will be called on when it's your turn to speak. For people calling in by phone only, you are to listen in, listen in mode only and cannot be called upon. Staff, as a reminder to the staff, quick reminders to the public and share who is next speaker is. Please state your name, address for the record, and you can begin. At the end of time, at the end of time for statements, you'll be uh, thanked for your comments. Perfect, Jack. Thank you. May I interject here, Jack, for a second? We, we no longer require addresses, just if they would please indicate what ward they live in. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, the timer is placed on the screen to inform individuals how much time they have for their um, public statement. Um, and we will do our best to make sure that we hear um, as many people as we can during this time. Um, as a good reminder, please just state your name and your ward number. That would be great. And uh, remember to unmute your mic. And our first speaker is Ben Christensen. And I am just going to unmute Ben's mic. And Ben, I believe you can unmute your mic at this time. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. I want to speak about the uh, Springfield Police Department. Um, my, yeah, my name is Ben Christensen. Um, and I just wanted to say, like, um, it's well known that the Springfield Police Department has a history of violence uh, against people of color. Oftentimes, this violence is unprovoked or disproportionate to the situation. 
This is well documented. Um, but the excessive use of force um, that we see against them it isn't, it's only half of the problem. The other side of that, is, uh, the flip of the coin, is the collaboration that we see with known um, violent white nationalists, many of whom have arrest records and histories of violence against the BIPOC community. <clears throat> it's not, it's not, and it's not just the collaboration that's the problem. It is the preferential treatment that they receive when it comes to things like protests and other displays that we see uh, that happened, especially with this lockdown and them um, trying to uh, provoke the police during the lockdown by not adhering to the guidelines. This puts everyone in the community in danger and it emboldens them to continue acting out and test the limits of what the SPD will allow. Uh, yeah, the, what, and what this does is it, it puts everyone in the community in danger by exposing us to things like COVID-19, them openly carrying firearms and other weapons, including pepper spray, and the known violence against the BIPOC community. I do not agree with the tactics used by the SPD against the BLM protesters, but this heavy-handed approach even if they were to use it on the white nationalists, I don't think that would be a solution. I think we need to find a better way to move forward. And what this does with the Springfield Police Department is it gives a clear signal to the people of color in the community that they do not value them. They don't value their lives, their families, their communities, their culture. They just simply don't value them. And this is unacceptable. It needs to change. Okay, our next speaker is Elizabeth Utterback. And Elizabeth, I have unmuted your mic. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, Lizzie Utterback, Word 3. Um, first, I'd like to thank Michael Bean for responding to my concerns last month regarding this committee's charge of long-range planning. In my mind, policy is a key part of long-range planning, and I hope you continue to review this charge and its implications on the work you do here. I believe good and transparent policy will lead to a safer community, increased trust, and decreased costly lawsuits. Today, I also have a follow-up question to the materials Chief Lewis presented last month about use of force. The pie graph he presented included use of force associated with arrest. At a November City Council meeting, someone pointed out that the pie graph should have included a slice for firearm deploy, deployed if the chart encompassed last year or the year before, because during each of those two years, Springfield police killed a community member with a firearm. I didn't hear Chief Lewis respond to that comment, and I would like to hear an explanation tonight. And this relates to another question I have. What about use of force that occurs outside of an arrest or doesn't result in an arrest? How are those use of force numbers tracked, and how do they compare with the information that was presented? Lastly, at that same November council meeting when discussing the November 9th incident on 42nd Street, when an officer initially refused to make a report after a black 18-year-old high school student was assaulted by a white man in tactical gear, I learned from counselor Pichonary about kissing off reports. This reminds me of something I might have done in middle school when I didn't want to do a book report, but that is pretty low stakes compared to police reporting. So I'd like to know how frequent of a practice is kissing off reports at SPD? Is this part of the culture there? What are the policy implications for this? And how might this behavior affect other data that is outwardly reported, such as stops, data, et cetera? Thank you. Okay. That is the extent of the individuals who have requested to speak this evening. If that's the last uh, public comments, I would like to thank you folks for uh, your comments. Hey, Jack, if you don't mind, uh, I don't think we would get into a typical habit where I'm going to answer specific questions, but I think I can do this really quickly. 
regarding some of the comments there. There was a question about my presentation to, that I made to the council regarding the, the pie chart and there were no dis, uh, issues or there was no uh, counting of the shootings our officers were involved in. And that is correct. That that's an error on our part. When and the reason that is is because we run the when we run a report uh, of all the uses of force, they are, they come from our case numbers. And when you have a uh, shooting, you have the infit team come in and do the actual investigation, and therefore it comes underneath another agency's case numbers. And it was just my fault for the oversight. So uh, that's how that got missed. The other question regarding uh, that was, uh, I remember I right hear the use of force. Uh, remember what, what I, she was cutting out a little bit on my computer, so didn't catch all of that. But the 42nd Street incident, uh, officers are not do not kiss off reports. Uh, we've corrected that situation. It got handled, uh, and there was an arrest made in, in that particular thing. And I think there was one other thing. If somebody remembers what uh, she asked, let me know. I don't like it, it was hard for me to hear. Chief, this is Jen. Um, I think the only other question that I noted, and I apologize because. Um, I feel like I'm missing some data from last meeting as well, but uh, I believe she asked a question about how use of force is tracked when there's not an arrest. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, well, I can't imagine that there ever is a use of force case that doesn't have a police report attached to it. The officers are required by policy if they use physical force against somebody to write a police report. And I, I can't imagine a situation that, uh, you know, you're making, you're using physical force and not making an arrest, uh, or if there are some extenuating circumstances, the minimum you're doing is at least writing a police report. So there should always be a police report uh, with every type of, uh, any type of physical force between an officer and a citizen. Thank you, Jennifer, for reminding me of that. Well, it looks like the next thing on the agenda is business from the chief. Well, Jack, you've got one up above that. The Mary Bridget Smith, the city attorney, was going to come and talk uh, about the bylaws with the committee. Okay, I don't see it on this, but that's fine. Uh, good evening, committee members. This is uh, Mary Bridget Smith. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, well, thank you for um, giving me some time on your agenda tonight. I am here before you to talk about your committee bylaws and then give you an update on um, some work the council has been doing on its um, boards, commissions, and committees. So you have some draft bylaws as part of your packet. Um, those are in content really your same bylaws. They've just been moved into a standardized form. Uh, and updated. And so um, our direction is to do this for all of the councils, boards, commissions, and committees. So it's just sort of an update and a refresh. It's the same content from your previous bylaws has moved over to this new format. And then the last section, um, additional provisions, has um, anything that's particular to your committee that couldn't fit into other sections. And we wanted to make sure we didn't leave anything off. And then we also referenced the resolution from um, 96 where this committee was uh, created. Uh, the council has been doing a lot of work over the last year, looking at its boards, commissions and committees, particularly with how they do recruitment. And um, I have watched the council um, deal with their uh, volunteers uh, for boards, commissions and committees for a long time. And it's really important to them um, that people are, um, feeling appreciated for what they're doing, and they really um, do appreciate the service that you do. So they've implemented um, and tried a batch recruitment system where they look at recruiting once a year um, with the idea that they might get a better idea overall of who's who wants to volunteer on committees. 
And um, then we're working on a guide uh, just to support volunteers with information about ethics and public meetings and that kind of thing. So you'll see that coming in the new year. But it's really just an opportunity for us to kind of get stuff a little bit shaped up. So that's why I'm here tonight. If you have any questions about these bylaws or anything that um, you want to see added or changed, um, the next step in the process after you tentatively approve them, I take them to council for um, final approval and then they're finalized. And I'd be happy to take any questions or uh, concerns that you have. So we, we approve them tonight, is that part of our charge? Yeah, if you could approve your bylaws, say by a two thirds vote, you'll approve. And then once I have that approval, I can take it to the council, probably be in a January meeting, and then I'll, um, those will, Jessica, I'll bring them back to you. Uh, I read them, they look pretty good. In fact, I met today with David Atkins. He's our bylaws attorney to update our bylaws. So these look really good and I'm kind of refreshed in it. Well, that's good to hear. <laughs> so everybody here pretty much likes them? I move we adopt them. I second that. I'm in favor of them also. They look good to me. Mm -hmm. I agree. Agreed. So I believe everyone's on camera and everyone, if we could just maybe do a thumbs up and then I'll, if we agree. Yep, Eric and Adams just joined us. Right, perfect. Good evening. Thank you for that. And then Issa, if you're still on, if you could give a verbal um, approval if you see fit? I was thinking, you can see me, I can't see you. Yes. I, I did make a note. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. So I have made note of that approval. Thank you. And I, I think this also is an opportunity that was brought up at prior meeting for op the opportunity to ask uh, Mary Bridget some questions in regards to um, the committee and the role and some of those unique questions. And this is um, a good initial opportunity for that discussion. If anybody would like to take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. hey, Mary Bridget, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in here just because uh, I've heard this question come up over the years from some of the members and so, what is the expectation when a committee member is contacted by the public? Uh, you know, and that, how, how are they supposed to respond uh, as a committee member when they're contacted outside of this meeting I'm talking about? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, if you are, when you're in the context of like this committee meeting, this is a public meeting subject to public meetings law, but when you're on your own time and someone wants to talk to you about the committee, I would recommend, or or what's happening with the committee, um, you're certainly welcome to listen to them, but I would recommend that you direct them to make their comments to the council or to the committee as a whole, and then the whole committee has the information. And also, I think it's more in line with your role that you're a volunteer on a volunteer committee. You don't have to um, engage with folks on your own time um, about these issues. You certainly could chat with people, but I would always direct them back to your committee meetings or the council. I think for me, when I, and I probably was presented with a, a somewhat of an understanding that has been lost for me since um, we've had so much community comment and it feels like which is very important, I'm not minimizing that. Uh, just understanding our role and all of that, and then I know that we have a process with the long-term planning, but I'm not up to speed as well on where we are with that and what, what that looks like moving forward for us. I, I guess I just have some need for clarity in, in that for me. And I can, Jessica and I can probably talk about that and I'll take a stab at it first. So that is kind of the main charge of this committee. And we have looked at this. We actually have a plan 
uh, survey coming out and we hopefully use those survey results to kind of guide uh, the long range plan. I think you guys have heard me talk about, you know, long range plan used to be 15, 20 years. It's probably down to five now, uh, just the way uh, technology advances. And we are planning on doing that. The city has had uh, a mission vision statement that they were trying to get uh, going and we were kind of hoping to wait and piggyback on that. And so Really, we uh, have, have tried to decide whether we just go ahead and go forward or we still wait for the city to, to do that, to sit down with this committee and figure out where does SPD want to be in, in five years. And Jessica, you want to jump in whatever I left out there? No, I, I think you're right on that we just kind of reviewed our, our notes and the last time that it had come up about citizen survey, we'd also talked about um, <laughs> plan and that um, some of the research in that regard that oftentimes it is um, good as a best practice to roll a department's long-range plan to make sure that it can align with the city's um, goals and objectives as well. And so um, with the understanding that I don't, I don't think any of us thought it would um, um, take, take as long as to get to where we want to go at this point, and so maybe now's the time to, to reassess that decision, which is absolutely, absolutely fine. So um, we were just, I think, going along with what we previously discussed, but it's always a good time to reassess. Yeah, and I think, you know, the, the predicament we have always here is, is we're interested in what you have to say and where you'd like to see the police department going. We have ideas, obviously, and but we don't want to present those ideas and drive the conversation. And uh, we're, so I think that uh, what we can probably do is uh, just start working on this. Uh, hopefully that uh, the survey will help us kind of guide to see where the citizens are at and where they'd like to see us go. I think that would be beneficial for you as committee members and it's definitely beneficial for me uh, once we get that survey results in. So that's, I think we can put this, you know, if the committee's willing to uh, get this going in the, here in the near future. And then, you know, if we get to a point where the city is coming up with theirs, and we can, you know, if we need to stall a little bit uh, before we jump out in front of the city, we can, uh, or however that works out. Joe, do you have a, you have a comment about that? I know we're right in the middle of, of a lot of changes and a lot of updating and i think that um <clears throat> we can easily get the cart before the horse so i would i would recommend that we take a look at this maybe just a a high a high elevation look at it when we get that survey back so we can maybe start a foundation of where we're going but i wouldn't get too committed into uh, spending a lot a ton of time until we find out where that's going to come from uh, council as far as specifically what what the committee is going to be charged with doing yeah i, I agree that the and if, when the committee comes up and we come up with a long-range plan obviously the council gets final approval of that yeah. right yeah, right i told you it needs to be kind of a high level so Barry, yeah. does that answer your question Barry? uh yeah i mean i, I think that's helpful i i knew that's been a part of it but it, it um i have missed us uh, talking too much about it and, and that could be on me um, but so I just was unclear on how that fits where we're going no uh, I think oh, uh, go ahead Michael sorry I was agreeing with Barry and that's why I thought we recommended at the last meeting that we do a work session so we could define that and and go with that um, with the survey or or wherever we're supposed to go Mary Bridget are you still on yeah, I'm here. Can you kind of talk about the work session so everybody has an understanding? Um, well, you could, um, if this committee wants to have an agenda item for um, during one of these meetings that specifically reverse to the survey, you could certainly do that. Um, I'm not quite sure. Can you tell me more what you mean about a work session? Well, go ahead, Michael. Well, what I was thinking about is what we should be doing at this meeting. I'm kind of like Barry. I don't know which, you know, what what we should be doing. So mm -hmm. I thought a work session, we could hammer that out so we'd have much more clarity and direction. Uh, 
It wasn't necessarily to be during this meeting, if I remember correctly, but I'm not sure about that either. Oh, I see. Well, recall that you're a public, uh, you're an advisory body to a governing body. So that means any meeting you have is subject to public meetings law. So I think that's why my brain went to, you could just have it during one of these meetings. So that means notice and uh, minutes and that kind of stuff. So this would be the most convenient time to do that. I don't recommend, and you could have a subcommittee, but that's also a public meeting. If you have a subcommittee who wants to deal specifically with the survey or some aspect of your um, long range planning, you could certainly do that. Um, that's an option, but just recall that that would still be um, technically a public meeting. A public meeting is fine. Yeah, yeah. however, um, however you want, your bylaws allow for subcommittees. And, and this too is, is uh, you know, to label something, in my mind, to label something a work session. I mean, I look at these meetings as a work session. Each each time we meet is a work session and we're going over different things, different facts and coming up with potentially different recommendations. So uh, I don't see the need to, I guess you want to call it something different, that's fine, but, but I really see these meetings as work sessions. Um, but also, uh, and I agree with you, Michael. Like we need one. We need future meetings, and I think we talked about this, the survey results. And I think that requires us to kind of gurgitate exactly what the public is telling us, and then go from there. So uh, I don't think anybody is. Is I agree with you. We need to uh, come up with something, and but we need to have materials to to really get clarity, like you said. And I agree, Barry. It, it's it's. I too want to be able to see this group of volunteers have the tools to be able to put things forward that are useful to the community otherwise why have this committee so i i really am pro that i don't want to i'm not trying to push it down or anything but we really need to have those tools and i think that the very first step is is the results of that survey otherwise it's a guessing game so i i, I want to move forward and I, and I don't think no one's poo-pooing that idea michael at all i i think everybody wants to do that so I'm all about doing it during these meetings too, because they're public public meeting, just like Mary Bridget said, and and um, just move forward. But we got to get we got to get the tools to build the house. Okay. Okay. Well, thank. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Eric. Thanks. Um, can you guys hear me? I'm on a different computer this evening, so just want to make sure that the audio is all right. Uh, apologize for joining in late, uh, but I did have a question, and I'm not sure if it's uh, one for Mary Bridget or um, Councilor Fishnery, or maybe Chief Lewis, maybe a combination of all three. But with respect to um, having a representative from Willamette and Park and Recreation District, and then also speak with public schools, not to speak for Jen, but um, as this committee is going to be potentially working on long range planning and strategic planning and, and advising the police department in that regard, what is historically has been the expectation for agency representatives to be coordinating with our respective decision making bodies? So for me, if a question is brought to this committee, should I be, is the expectation that I um, conferred with and coordinated with our board of directors as to what Willamaline's position is on a particular matter. Uh, I'll start if it's okay, Joe, or do you want to start? Uh, I'll go ahead. You know, the idea behind the long range plan is to make sure that we're doing what the community wants and make sure we're not doing something that's going to adversely affect either the schools or Willamette Lane, or we're going to, you know, take resources away that maybe been helping you out. I mean, just to give you a silly example this, this side we decided to pull sros you know and, and that's not something that the schools may want may not want to do or something and so the idea is just to get your your input and then you're welcome to share all that input uh, with, with your boards and, and your staff there we just want to make sure that when we make decisions that, ha that they're not having an adverse impact on things and as as you know a lot of times we people have great intentions and they real we don't realize how it might impact somebody else Thank you, Chief. That's helpful. And I see your your position, both you and Jenna, being kind of a between a rock and a hard place, or potentially between a rock and a hard place. 
And I think it may be easy for when you start to see or feel as though this is an area that that um, is not something that's you're going to be presenting to your board or need to present to your board or even involve your board. Um, you know, that's one of those things where you could even either recuse yourself out of the decision making process um, or and or just uh, not engage in the conversation. Um, and if and if we have a meeting that is solely, I think, solely dealing with a specific subject that may put you in a contrary position, then then you don't necessarily have to attend um, to prevent that, because I, I wouldn't want to be any part of putting you two in a position of uh, in a contrary position with either one of your boards. Yeah, and, I, and we also, I, that's a good point, uh, Councilor Missionary, is we don't want to put you in a position where you have to make a decision for your agency. I mean, we're just getting your input. And if we need that decision uh, in the planning, then we would ask you to go to your boards and, or make arrangements for us to come and talk to your boards. No, thank you. I appreciate that. You know, from from my side, you know, I think I can safely speak for Langley and saying we would not want to um, inadvertently or necessarily delay a process and be able to, to make progress um, on strategic planning initiatives or, or other um, other aspects. So you know, that opportunity to potentially recuse ourselves or you know, at least you know, ask for some temporary delay until we can get that input but that's appreciated and then and then i was just going to jump in oh sorry no, go ahead. i really appreciate eric bringing that up um one it it along the lines of one of the questions i had had as well and i think that what um i appreciate with mary bridget and jessica and chief bringing our bylaws back to the front of the session is right there in the section one overall purpose is really not a decision making body. It's really just an input evaluation and feedback. Like that last line is really um, what helps me make the decision on what level um, I'm able to speak both on behalf of the district or just from my lens at the district. And uh, it's really about input um, and feedback rather than um, that, that decision. So even when we're talking about policies, we're just providing that feedback on that lens. We're not. Um, drafting policies. We're not um, recommending creation of policies. We're just giving the perception of all of the, uh, you know, non-sworn folk in the world. And so um, I, I like that that is grounding in our work. It's really just an input point. Yeah, that that was exactly, and, I, if in his, and correct me if I'm wrong, Chief, is that We've uh, passed members from both Willamette Lane representatives and school board or school representatives, school district representatives. We've really looked as a committee as to information that you're getting from the community, feedback that you can provide, open communications. It's really helping with the heartbeat of the community, but you, and and the school district and the park and recreation district are a huge part of being able to hear what's going on in the community, and that's and that's really the input that that your folks, uh, your positions really are used for. And so, yeah, no, I don't think anybody's gonna uh, require you or even ask you to be part of a, a policy recommendation and put you in contrary with your boards. And so we totally, res I totally respect that and I understand that completely. Yeah, I think a good example is for Eric, I think is uh, what you guys are doing with all the parks and the trails and stuff. and and by just letting us know what you're doing in your future plans that may change we may end up having one of our motor officers be one of those more enduro type motorcycles in the future you know be, to be able to you know service those pathways and beyond that i mean it's a consideration for us as as this grows so i just want first dibs on that applic that job application that's okay <laughs> All right, Jack, I think we're ready for the next thing. Unless anybody else has anything else? Mm -hmm. Well, it looks to me like now we're down to about uh, uh, business from the audience. Well, I think we're actually, Jack, if, I think we're at business for me right now. Is yeah, that, is that, okay, that's yeah. cool. 
And so we, we've got uh, Lieutenant George Crawley here. Uh, George, there you are. I'm going to let uh, George do. Uh, this is the chance we're going to go over some uh, policies we sent you. I think hopefully you got the use of force draft and the body worn camera draft and realize these are in draft forms. We still got a couple hoops to jump through for final approval of these. But I wanted to run these both by you guys to see from your perspective, are you seeing something we're missing or something you don't understand uh, that doesn't make sense uh, and make those recommendations to us or just point that out uh, for us. And I think I'll let George go first so he can go to bed and go home after this. Uh, and then I'll do the use of force. So George is gonna do the body worn camera uh, draft policy and he can walk you through that or I can help out with, with that. So George, I'll turn it over to you. It's up to me. Okay. Um, first of all, thanks for letting me uh, join you tonight. Uh, part of the policy development for us in keeping with best practices for policy development on body cams across the nation is uh, getting some community input from groups like yourself. Um, the, a lot of the policies we come up with isn't something we just make up on our own. Uh, we borrow from other agencies. We review best practices from not just local agencies, but nationwide. So when we uh, author a policy like this, it's supposed to be comprehensive and try to cover as many bases as we can. Um, it's, it's, I want to say it's a 12 page policy or so right now. Um, there's going to be some more edits at some point uh, once everybody's done reviewing it. But what I want to hear from you is if, uh, upon review, if you see something that you have a question about or you have a concern or you'd like to see removed or added that type of thing and uh, that's something i could take note of sit back with our committee our command staff and see if that's something uh, we need to or can change but i'm really interested in your input on uh, what you've reviewed so far i didn't get a chance to review the camera i did review the other uh, use of force so but I will catch up. Okay, and uh, by all means, contact Jessica. If anybody has questions, she'll forward uh, any questions to me. Jessica's part of the team that's also uh, developing our policy for the body cams. It's been- When, uh, when are you gonna get all the body cams? Uh, I think we're looking at early next year, um, spring-ish right oh, now. Spring. And I'll let Jessica talk more about this if she wants to add in. We were awarded a grant. Um, through Department of Justice, through through the federal, it was a federal grant we we earned. Part right. of that um, receiving that means we have to jump through some more hoops, and we're more than happy to do that in order to save the city a ton of money when we get this grant. It's it's worthwhile to, for us to cater our program to make sure we're checking boxes for the feds so we can obtain this money. So it pushes back, things back just a little bit from our initial target of February first, which was pretty aggressive to begin with, um, but we're not too far from that. Right. Yes, sir. Thanks, Lieutenant. Um, I read through it, it seemed fairly comprehensive to me just based on my fairly rudimentary understanding of what a policy like this should include. Um, and with body work and it's becoming more ubiquitous, I would imagine that in jurisdictions across the country is there sort of a uniform set of best practices that most jurisdictions are looking to as they're developing these policies or certain agencies maybe they're kind of at the forefront in terms of best practices that you've reviewed? But what was your question, Eric? Did, if we've considered best practices from the other agencies? Just, I, yeah, I guess, you know, what, what is the source of best practices that you look to? I mean, like I said, the policy to me looks fairly comprehensive. Um, so initially, yeah, initially we get guidelines from the Bureau of Justice Assistance. Um, it, they've, it's a packet they've developed over the years. It's through the Department of Justice. And they've compiled a lot of policies, procedures, uh, questions. Prior to me uh, talking tonight, I was reviewing a, uh, a document. Basically, it's a checklist. It's a, it's a re policy review scorecard. And they provide us basically a list of things suggesting we put them in policy because it's best practice of all the agencies they oversee. Uh, in addition to that, I reached out to about uh, 10 or 11 different agencies across the country asking for their policies and finding out what worked for them, what didn't work for them, what hurdles they had to overcome with uh, labor unions, with the community, uh, with their own officers' use of it. So uh, we 
borrowed a lot from other agencies, not just in Oregon, but DOJ gave us a lot of guidelines. Oh, that's great. Thank Eric, you. the other thing is that there's actually state law that regard that actually governs some of what you can and can't do with these particular policies, and that's those have all been integrated in there. And the ones we're we're interested in is you know that may have uh, effects on the public is that you know the privacy considerations of when officers should or shouldn't have this on uh, when an officer goes into a hospital setting uh, or you're taking a report from a victim who doesn't wish to be recorded or you're involved in a sex abuse case. And there's a lot of things to think about the times when that camera should should be on, obviously, or it should be off. And that's something the policy is it is co comprehensive. They've done a good job with this so far. And we just want uh, this committee to take a really hard look at it. And if there's anything that bothers you or you're just kind of scratching your head about or you think it should be added there, just let us know. Uh, we do we take that, you know, because it does have an effect on the public. Uh, it's, it'll be different. Uh, I think the citizens are all getting used to this nationwide. Uh, but when our officers walk up and they tell you tell you we're being recorded, that's a little bit different than we've done in the past. Uh, but I don't think nowadays it seems to be uh, at least about half the police agencies in the nation have them. And uh, so that's not going to be too big a surprise to anybody, I don't think. Chief? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Barry. Just, I'm going to uh, admit I have not had a chance to really go through it and read it. I saw it, but um, was not having the opportunity yet. Will we have, can we take some time and then get back to you? Is there a timeline that we should get back to you if we have any other feedback or questions? Uh, you, you're, you're fine. I mean, we got a few weeks. We've got a lot more hoops to jump through and uh, take your time and then just shoot us an email or call us, uh, whichever works best for you. Yeah, be happy to, to hear your feedback on it. You know, policy is always a tricky thing. You can write a policy, you can put so much detail in something and to the point where it's so big no one ever reads it, uh, or, or you can make it too short and it doesn't isn't comprehensive enough. So I'm always trying to find that middle ground that uh, we're going to read it, people are going to know it, uh, and it's going to cover what we need it to cover. Yes, Joe. Joe? So, um, on page 10 of that geo i'm looking through that when it comes to when it, in regards to uh supervisor authorized to review relevant recordings under the following circumstances and i'm going through that list and it's a very it's a it's a great list and i noticed too that is uh, number seven which says any probationary employee may have their recordings reviewed by a supervisor etc cetera, etc cetera, for training purposes um, but i didn't notice in there i didn't see in there that allows supervisors to randomly look at uh, video recordings to see where we are as a standard in the street with with officers of experience and with officers, um, you know, was that a something where you feel in pushback from SPA, or was that does that make am I off base here, George? Um, no, not necessarily. Uh, we haven't got pushback from SPA, is what I'd say. Um, what we've learned with DOJ and other agencies is that language is not in there because of um union concerns of that type of behavior spa hasn't reached out to us and said you know telling us what we can and can't put in there yet it's a collaborative effort but those type of concerns uh in labor law are a concern that supervisors would use as a, a, phys a fishing expedition to discipline an employee or and just look for things so um i'll let chief add further yeah on. I've got kind of a history on this. So uh, back when uh, another chief was here, uh, part of the we started with having uh, the in-car video, uh, the DUI car, and then we were planning on getting body cameras. So in a in a uh, contract long ago, I think 2013 actually, I may not be that long ago, uh, but they negotiated a, a body camera policy into the contract. And that was part of that negotiation was that it couldn't be utilized for just random review. And so that's something we'd have to address to change. I think it would be, I mean, I, I, I can definitely see both sides of that for sure. Yeah. Um, but it also, I think as be, you know, when a, if a supervisor is going with good thoughts, pure heart and, and wanting to make sure that we've got to set a nice high bar and actually at officers doing things great, that can be shared or learned from, it seems like that door is kind of being closed 
Um, but so maybe you can add in there, uh, working with the officer, that those his videos or her videos can be viewed, et cetera. Just, uh, it just seems like there's, there's not an opportunity to be able to address that and say, hey, we want to, you know, we want to look at your stuff. You're doing a great job. We want to be able to share that. Um, doesn't necessarily, it's not, isn't necessarily allowed. Yeah, it's kind of a, a tricky thing. So you can use it for training purposes. You can go back and look for training purposes. If you receive a complaint, right. if, I, if I receive a complaint about an officer, I can go back and look regarding similar situations of that. And then as you go through, you may see other stuff. Uh, you know, an exemplary, you know, when, when officers do great things, we do want to be able to to go through there and look at those. And that is allowed uh, so that we can use it to, for training for other officers and show it as a demonstration of, hey, this is really how you do it, watch this. And uh, yeah, it's, it's one of those things that, that's in there and it's it ha becomes a negotiable issue. So we have to deal with uh, the union on it. Right, and I, I just want to make sure we have all the options available if possible. Yeah, yeah totally agree. And then the very last thing I noticed too is that um, the, uh, I like where you indicated that the digital data is property of the department, um, but I do know that there is a propensity of of some of that stuff. I know from neighborhood agencies, et cetera, the, some of the body worn camera digital material is out in the world. And so I, I'm just concerned, you know, which is, can be a very negative thing, especially if it has any type of potential for criminal prosecution, as you know that. Um, so it, it just, it's prohibited, so I assume that the uh, wording in some other policy states that you cannot violate any of these other GOs as part of that policy, correct? Meaning, meaning George, you know what I'm saying? I, or, yeah, I know what you're saying, and I think uh, the chief probably has the, he probably knows the GO better than I do. There is a general order we have that prohibits uh, officers or any employee from sharing any kind of evidence, evidence, and that could be video evidence, it could be photographs, it could be recordings. That general order covers any kind of uh, release of information to the public without authorization, especially a case under investigation. Um, that goes for any evidence at all. Yeah, I thought there was something there, but I did, it was just in this, it was just kind of hinted on the on the bottom of this of this uh, geo that it was prohibited to give it out because it belongs to the agency. So, okay. Cool. That's all. I think it's worked great, and it looks like you know it looks familiar with some of the writings on there and it, and some other agencies, and and I think it's pretty strong. And I assume it's been vetted, and you vetted that through maybe DOJ, state DOJ maybe. Um, right, right now, federal uh, Department of Justice at this point, but Good. it's basically we've gone through the state statute and copied and pasted all the relevant you know materials that need to be required to be in there, and made sure we're in compliance with that. And we're working with other the other attorneys, local uh, city prosecutors, district attorneys for their review also. Well, it looks great and it's great work. And if you look on there on the front of that first page, it talks about that up on the very top there, the general order cross-reference guy that it talks about the ICB, the in-car video. That's a policy that we are working on right now. And uh, part as as you guys remember, I think is you know, once we got the body cameras, you also saw the value of the in-car video. Uh, so we have to, you know, I don't want to write two policies that are basically the same, but it's just a little bit different of when, when it's activated and how you how to utilize it. So we will have to write a separate policy for regarding that. And I don't know where you guys are at on that, George. You're probably you're, you're on it, I think. Yeah, we're moving along on it. We have a rough, rough draft on that. The body cam policy takes precedence right now because of the grant, and it specifically addresses body cam, so that has to be done first. And uh, not to mention, it's going to take a little longer to get the in-car videos installed. Um, the body cams, once they're active, we can plug them in and put them out there. Your plans to share the ICV policies when you have them ready? Yes. Yep. Excellent. Excellent. Anything else for George or me on, on regarding the the, bo or the body cameras? Any other questions? Looks good, George. Good work. Yeah. Well, thanks, George. Okay, and thank you. You're, wel Happy you're welcome. To, you're welcome to stay if you want. You don't have to roll. <laughs> I'm going to stick around. I'll just put my camera off, but I'll listen. Thank you. <laughs> is, uh, I have a question. Uh, is uh, rank and file excited to get them, or are they apprehensive? Um, if you would ask me that question 15, 20 years ago, Michael, I would have said apprehensive. These days, excited. People, okay. um, we have a lot of good employees that want the public to know they do a good job, and they want the public to see the difficult 
things they go to day to day. And I think this is an opportunity to do that. And I think going back a little bit earlier, what Joe was saying about making sure we share the good news, I'm going to encourage our supervisors to share with the officers if you're a, you know, a part of an incident that is good, we, we ought to share with the public or we ought to share for training purposes to go to their supervisor and say, hey, I like, I like for the, you know, the shift to watch this. This is an important training tool and something good. And more and more people are receptive to it every day. That's great. Yeah, I think the other thing for the, the individuals that are close to my age, you know, the technology you know, <laughs> challenge people of the world, I think that was kind of a hurdle, but they have made them uh, simple enough now for the downloads and then a lot of that stuff. And uh, it's actually not going to be such a burden. Uh, you know, the, like I said, I, I've talked about before, the biggest concern I've always had is is the extra time it takes the officer off the street to deal with the, with the camera. You know, that's a, that's a difficult thing. Even if it's 15 minutes, if you times that times all the number of officers, that's less time you have policemen out there doing their typical duty. So. But I think they've got it down. I know that George and, and the rest of the committee, uh, Jessica and others, have done a really good job of, of getting this to the point where it's going to be as little impact on our daily operations as possible. All right, I'm going to move on to the use of force policy uh, we have there. And so just to kind of, I'll just give a, uh, just so you understand what you're looking because you got all kinds of different colors and strikes throughs and underlines and all that stuff. And that's just because it's kind of gone back and forth between people. So if you see us, if you see something in that policy, whoops, sorry, my light keeps going out. I'm not going to see this. Yeah. If you, if you look on the first page there, just as an example, right in the end of the discussion, uh, you see that first sentence is, uh, is crossed out. That just means that was existing policy and it's been crossed out and changed. And then the underline is the changed policy is what we've added to it. Uh, so anywhere you see an underline, that means that's new language that is put in. Or if it's highlighted, as you see on page three, the yellow there, uh, yellow and the red is highlighted. That's also new uh, policy as you go through this and i don't think we got any other colors going on in here uh, so basically any of those type of things are either new or the cross outs and so as you can see here there, there's fairly significant changes a lot of these are driven by a couple of big factors uh, the biggest factor is, is the, there's a lot of house bills uh, at the state legislature that that uh, has a lot of these changes and we've incorporated those in some of the changes in there are incorporated from a lawsuit. I think that's been mentioned here before. So some of the changes you'll see in here are, are incorporated. So I, I'm not gonna, when I go through this and talk about changes, I'm not gonna specifically say which ones are which, uh, but it uh, that those are kind of where the changes came from, or they're just simply housekeeping changes from us, some, some changes over the years. So uh, I think what would be reasonable is me to just kind of go through it really quickly and then come back? Or have you, do you guys feel like you've read it enough and you got the questions you want to ask now without me boring you to death here? You want me to go through it real quick or? I've read it, but I don't know if others had a chance. Yeah, I've, I've read it, but I would like you to go through it. It's when I was in the military, we had rules of engagement and, and, uh, I mean, I don't think we were ever allowed to shoot anyone. So uh, it just got <laughs> crazy, you know, pop smoke, do this, do that. Um, but this seems pretty comprehensive. Yeah, yeah, you know, there's a lot of, uh, probably the biggest thing on the first uh, page there, these are just kind of uh, some housekeeping things, a little bit different way of saying the same thing under the discussion there. Uh, then you get into uh, the use of force, uh, Again, these are just, these are good additions. Uh, it gives clear direction on what we hope uh, the outcome of our officers. You know, unfortunately we have to use physical force on occasion. We would rather not. Uh, it's just, unfortunately it's part of the job. It's part of human nature. And we, but we want, the goal is that our officers use the minimal amount of force necessary to overcome the resistance of the individual they're dealing with. And that's the, what we're gonna, in the policy, uh, we're gonna pound in the policy and also pound in the training. And, and uh, you know, what would a reasonable person do in, in those circumstances? So that's what we're trying to write the policy for. So um, I, I see all your new de-escalation stuff, which I think is great, but boy, it sure depends on the training, who the trainers are 
and how you train them. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and you know, if you look back on, on uh, you know, look back on my career, and some people are really good at de-escalating, and we call it calming down in, in the old days. You know, uh, the situation or slowing things down. Uh, but the de-escalation is, and you're right, you can have all the great policies in the world, but if your training isn't there, then it's not going to really have that much effect on it. And the de-escalation stuff is, that's really just, we, we identify those officers who really do a good job regarding that, and those are the people who provide the training. And then with, uh, now with all the cameras and the different things you can find on the, the internet, you can show real good examples of both directions, both positive and negative uh, for the officers. I think when they see that, uh, it, it'll make more sense to them of what we're talking about here. And uh, yes, Barry. So um, again, I have so li limited experience. It really does look good. My question is about the word reasonable is used over and over. I bet that means something to you, but I, I bet it means something different to the public. And and, and so I, I wonder how are we more clear about that or how how do we I don't know. I, I I would hate the job of trying to determine what's reasonable, but I just see it used over and over again. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a stab at this. I may be joking and jump in there and, and, yeah. and help me with it. But that that yeah. word is in there because of a Supreme Court decision. Uh, it was a, a Graham versus Connor, and it's kind of the law, of the land, been for probably 30 plus years now. Uh, and it talked about the use of force, whether it was reasonable or not and so that's uh officers get a lot of training in that in that from the time they're hired uh they get it from their training officers they get it at the academy they get it from the district attorney's office and, and of course you're, you're you're right everybody you know what's reasonable to me and reasonable to somebody else may not be exactly the same but what they try to say in there what would an officer who has like training and experience do in that same situation would they make the same reasonable decision or would their decision be the same as what you just made? And that, that's kind of where, where it comes from is, you know, are you out there making some decision that only 20% of the people in the world might do? Or are you out there making a decision that 75 or 80% of the people would do in that situation? Uh, Joe, do you got any of the other words of wisdom to try to explain yeah. how that, what that means? There is, there is actually a, a uh, is, is my understanding, and again, I'm not I'm not an attorney or anything like that, but I've had a lot of training. Um, but there is a, a number standard. Um, if you think about it this way, um, it's it's more of a, a burden of proof thing. It starts with that. Um, is where when you have a criminal trial, you have somebody that to be convicted have to be meet the burden of of beyond reasonable doubt, which doesn't which doesn't mean a hundred percent, but beyond reasonable doubt. So use that word reasonable again. But then you and that's a criminal standard, criminal courts. But then you look at civil courts, and civil courts have got a completely different standard or burden that must must go, must rise to in order to find finding some sort of level of guilt or fault, um, and that and that's uh, beyond that's uh, more likely than not or by a preponderance, and the and which is the same as traffic court, and so so in civil trials, as long as if, if more than half of the jury ag agree that what you did was reasonable. So meaning seven out of the twelve, then that is that what that that's what they would consider being reasonable is where where um, the majority of the folks if they're asked given the same scenario, if you had twenty five people in a room and thirteen agree that what you saw or what you did would be the same thing they would do or they would agree with, then that would be considered reasonable. It's not a very high threshold, but it is more than likely than not or fifty one percent or better. That sound about right there. Chief? Yep. yep. So you know, I think the courts are just trying to, you know, give some kind of direction. Uh, one thing they they say uh, in that Supreme Court decision, they really kind of hammer home is it's, you know, your mate is it was the decision reasonable and but not under the bright light of uh, hindsight, uh, which is you know, it's Always what the officer right. knew at that exact time and place, and not what we learn later on. Uh, you know, what, what decision, why did he make that decision based, you know, factors there. And so I, I think it's one of the, one of the best uh, Supreme Court decisions that's come around, you know, for decades. And it does give the officers uh, uh, some ability to understand, you know, and not have, not have their decisions judged basically with hindsight, which none of us like that. Uh, not that we like that. I mean, but people make mistakes or people make 
decisions at moments because that's the appearance of what's happening in front of them and uh, they're not doing it for malicious purposes or anything like that uh what, one of the things you'll see in there or won't see in here is i think they talk about uh i think if i'm on jump to page three here and we're talking about the use of deadly physical force uh, one of the things that the house bill allows uh, and as a citizen, and I, I kind of cautious how I say this, uh, is that under certain circumstances, under uh, what they consider violent felonies, if you have uh, or serious uh, felonies, if you have a, someone who is escaping or running, you can technically you can use deadly force against them. Uh, we have never had, that. we've never allowed that here at Springfield PD. Uh, you may have a circumstance, I guess, that you could. If the individual has, you know, killed multiple people or something like that, but I, I'm talking about if you have somebody is, is breaks away from the officer and is just taken off running, but he's committed a very serious crime, we do not allow our officers to utilize their guns for that. And so, when you look at, if you actually compare to what I have here to House Bill, I think it's 4301, off the top of my head, uh, it would have all this would be in it except for that. And so we purposely remove that 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 we haven't allowed that and i don't think our almost no agency do at least here in oregon that. so hey chief yes excuse me terry here um under on that same page under number three under b there's a typo on there on deadly physical oh. force i see that thank you <laughs> you're welcome got it and chief the uh are you going? Are you referring to um, statement one, where it says make a lawful arrest when the police officer has probable cause to believe the person has committed? And that should be a violent felony instead of and violent felony. Yep. But um, so that goes right back to what you're saying that that that's not something the office um, allows. So it runs contrary to kind of what you were just saying. I'm going to read this here real quick for a second, Em. Yeah. Well, I think what the one I took out of there, it, it says violent felony, and then it said, then if you go down to two and three, I think that's to defend the officer or a third person during the course of that arrest. But I, I see where you, what you're talking about. I'll see. I'll clarify that there. Yeah. Yeah, just a little bit fuzzy, yeah. but it kind of kind of yeah. jumps over. Yeah. So I totally. Are you saying all those elements or should each one of those be or after each one of those statements yeah. right or yeah so i think i think this just got copied right out of the, the 4301 there so anyway i'll clean yeah. that up well, that's a good point yeah so after each one of those statements could could after each one of one two three and four could have an or after the semicolon or after the colon yep okay yeah, I think it's those that one and two there is, yeah. should go with that. That's the way it should yeah. be. Yeah. We can we can change that. Anything else on the next few pages or any questions? I got one on page six when you when you get to that. So just before I get there, I just talk about the, you guys have heard probably mostly the ban on, on uh, what they call, you know, uh, chokeholds or carotid, that we've talked about that, I think. And that was, that was a particular uh, ordinance and we put that in our policy here. And Councilor Pishner, what question do you have on page six? On page six, it says, let's see here. The last sentence where it says for specific treatment of individual first paragraph right underneath section five um last sentence where it says for specific treatment of individuals who have been sprayed with with chemical agents and you struck or oc spray and added or have been the subject of a taser deployment so um uh, chemical agents typically aren't sprayed yeah we, we're only pyrotechnic we need, yeah we need a, we need a better word than sprayed i'll fix that Okay, and then also, uh, in it, and I, I wrote in there what is potentially you can just change it to have have had a primary exposure to chemical agents, chemical agents, 
And that could mean that would allow you to have, whether it be pyrotechnic or aerosol just deployed, because as you know, chemical agents are different than OC, because OC is not considered a chemical agent. Yep. So would you say prior, prior exposure, that's what you had said, I believe. No, I meant primary. Would you just say exposure? No, I would say primary exposure because you have secondary exposure as well that doesn't wouldn't require any treatment whatsoever. But a I primary see. a primary exposure would be on your on applied to the person directly. I see. Thank you. Uh huh. That's good. Good, good catch there. And then just so the you know the GO one six one is authorized weapons and their use. And in that particular policy, it talks about if you use weapons, those type like a taser or something against someone. It, gives you specific uh, directions of what kind of medical treatment you're supposed to provide. Anything else? Other questions? I was still looking for Chief, if you had anything in there that allows your defensive tactics team or your use of force instructor team to have the ability to review use of force incidents or if there is some sort of trigger involved or trigger mechanism in the policy that allows that. I know it's been a contentious piece because of the separation of peers versus peer, you know, observations or whatever, you know what I'm saying, but there, is there any trigger yeah, or anything? It's more under the supervision, so the, right. that, that part of it. And so that the, they all go through, I think we talked about this, but every use force goes through the initial watch commander for the approval and then to our professional standards watch commander who will take a look at this. And if you look at the body worn camera program, now when we go to having body cameras, then they will, they can look at every use of force case. So when we talked earlier about they couldn't do random, you know, checks with the body camera, if there's a use of force, then there will, that will be reviewed by supervisors. And, and that's kind of my point. And I, I get that as far as the supervisor to see if there's maybe some discipline issues or or whatever. But but the supervisor or professional standards sergeant, et cetera, unless unless it's unique to this agency, typically are not your defensive tactics team instructors and they're not your use of force instructors. So therefore, what gives them the expertise to be able to say, hey, I see an issue here that may may allow for better training or change of our training strategy to help improve our out, overall outcome to the public. But it, it, what I've seen is it typically just stops right there and you have a person with no expertise making that decision, whether or not it's it's something that that where the agency needs to be at or identifying, hey, this is a training thing that, um, that may or may not be a training issue. You see what I'm saying? There's no real, I don't see where they would have the basis or the, the training to be able to make those calls other than looking for a, a policy violation and i'm not I, i'm not about trying to find violations i'm all about making sure that our officers are getting the best of the best and if there's some room for improvement to make that happen instead of finding out six incidences later that it should have been identified and we should have been training it six months ago yeah so i think i, I know exactly what you're talking about i think i can, can walk us through this and, and we do need to probably do this. So I think I've talked about this before. We do this in pursuits. So we, we review our pursuits. It goes through a process. And then we give our pursuits uh, every quarter to our uh, EVOC instructors, our emergency vehicle uh, instructors, and have them take a look at the pursuits for any training or any anything like that. And that's what you're asking for the use of force, which, which I agree with. And we can definitely do that. That's a good suggestion. Uh, if the if the sergeant does see an issue that isn't clearly he's not really sure or something or if this is you know is that correct or not uh, some of us just blatant it. you don't need anybody who's just a use of force instructor if you see something okay that's not right or uh, then we can make that decision if it's questionable then uh, then they do reach out to our uh, use of force instructor supervisor and to get an opinion uh, about that particular thing. And so that that is the mechanism we used in the past. And then the, and if it's a serious situation where either the officer or the uh, suspect in the case receives some type of serious injury, those are run those are run through the use of force review board, which as it's if you saw that in the documents, there's really specific uh, training that those individuals have to have. 
Does that, does that answer your question? I, I think what you're yeah. asking, and I, I agree 100%, is, is we need to create the same process that we've created for our pursuits in the use of force, even just, just so that they can review them. And we have been doing that. We do allow them to, to look at them so they, they have a general idea for their training, but we can make it more of a specific thing. I, I think it makes sense because, you know, EVOC, is, I, I agree that it's a high liability issue, high danger issue, et cetera. But, but I think what happens a uh, hundred times more so than, than a pursuit is the, is the use of physical force and in effect an arrest or defending oneself or, one, or another person. So it happens more often, but it, it just seems that I've observed in my career and whatnot that it's reviewed the least uh, in a sense of, of micro reviewed by, by the experts in that field to really look for some improvements in that area. And it, but I think that automatic trigger review, say here folks, this is our issues, are not issues, but these are the incidents would happen dig into them and, and see if there's room for training. They may come up with some scenario training. There's some excellent scenario training out of incidences that may or may not have a huge outcome, but it's a, it'd be a fantastic opportunity for instructors. And I, and I think that they're just not getting, potentially they're just not getting enough, but I, I may be wrong. And, and But I think if you had that automatic review of things and, and just do an info dump on them and have them spend a half, half an afternoon reviewing those things and, and looking for the next six months worth of training can come out of that. I, I turn to the degree. So we'll, we'll do that. Sorry to beat that dead horse, but oh no no, it's, that's totally fine. Right. Seems like it's important. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Anybody else have any questions regarding that? <clears throat> when are you going to finalize it? Uh, well, I, I, I have to. I still got to go back to the attorneys, and then any other changes to the, to the union, and uh, so I, I'm hoping not more a couple, few more weeks. So, right, good luck. most of these changes have been put into place, though. I mean, I just want people to understand that because the, they're, they're new laws. I mean, they're house bills, and so that information has already been given once those house bills became effective back. In, I think most of them were June 20th, if I remember right, and so that information has. They're already out operating under this those procedures right now. Speaking of that, how are you going to operate under 110 now? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Okay, uh, actually, I do. I have. We have had uh, a meeting with the district attorney. Uh, at least Springfield has. Uh, we're going to try to, to figure out how to navigate our way through that and see get, uh, you know direction from the district attorney's office and how how we're going to handle those situations that's maybe a, a good topic for a future meeting for this group so how are you going to operate through it <laughs> is it going to impact yeah you bet yeah we uh a lot going on before it passed and after it passed and uh, we were worried about funding being taken out of mental health services and out of uh, supplementary police services like cahoots to fund warehouses and things. So, uh, and the governor has postponed that till 22 so that there is an immediate impact, but a lot of other things are going on too. And I've just got a couple other really quick things I'll just kind of run through. If you have questions about it, you can ask uh, this, the applicant who's going to be appointed by the council will be done next next week, uh, next Monday. Is that for the minority position? Yes. Oh, great. Yeah. Who is? And well, I think I'm supposed to wait for the council, aren't I? Oh, okay. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we'll, we we have a meeting to get the, that particular person down here and, and get them uh, kind of you know, act so they understand the police department and give them some, we have a, a document as most of you remember that we give uh, a little notebook so everybody understands uh, some of the details of being on the committee. The other thing that's uh, out there, I, the question came up last week, I think East brought it up regarding how do we engage the uh, community in, in trying to understand use of force from a police officer's perspective or you know and one of the ways we went and looked at that we've done this in the past haven't done it for quite a while and we won't be able to do it until COVID's over obviously unfortunately it was the milo system and this is a, a kind of a shoot don't shoot situation that's kind of a, almost almost in 3d it's not quite 3d uh and it's, it's really it's really uh informative for people to go through that 
it's not done to embarrass anybody. It just shows the difficult situations and, uh, of what people have to do. And so we do hope to be able to bring that in the near future. But again, COVID is going to have to be passed before that happens. Um, and then if you saw in the paper, I think Eugene had something out about the professional stops data. The Oregon report came out. I'm going to have Jessica, we just got that. I'll have Jessica send the link to that to everybody. It's about a hundred page document, roughly. I uh, went to the link and Springfield is a tier two and I couldn't get access to a tier two. Just the oh, really? Uh huh. Okay. You know, I, I think that at least the link I have has all the data in there and uh, there, there's no concerns here at Springfield. Jessica and I haven't had a chance to paw through it. We hope to be able to go through it and then kind of synthesize it down into kind of a, a normal, you know, it's really an academic paper, the way they do that, uh, the methodologies and uh, the analytics that they use to uh, look into that situation. But it is very informative. Uh, if you're really, some of it will put you to sleep because, uh, just because of the way they go into the, the detail. But we hope to, by the next meeting, I think it will spend a little bit of time uh, once we've gone through that and so we can come and talk uh, about that specific data. Uh, I think it's important. I think it's important for the community to understand, uh, you know, where we're at and, and what the percentages are of the stops we make and whether there's enforcement action taken on those stops. Uh, all, all those kind of details are very important. And it's unfortunate that the way they, they put that that report out there because I think if they made it a little more user friendly, more people would probably read it uh, and understand it. But uh, we'll see if we can come up with a, a little bit better version. It's just that most people don't really want to take the amount of time it would take to walk through that thing. And they don't have it. There's no way to just, just pick Springfield PD and then show them compared to the other agencies. Uh, so we'll be able to go through that. But Jessica will send you that link um, either tonight or tomorrow. Uh, and if, if you really want to feel like you're back in college uh, doing stats class or something, oh. welcome back. So. Well, I, I recommend Jessica open it up and see if she can get to Springfield. Uh, okay. here. So. I've got, well, I've got it. I got it printed out here, right in my little hand here. And uh, it's it's got Springfield's part in here, and, and at least the one I have, so. Okay, and then I think, uh, Jack, that is it for me. Uh, Jessica, is that correct? Are we ready to move on? Yeah. That looks, looks like it was pretty well covered for on that. And from what I saw looking through it, there wasn't anything there that I misunderstood. I could understand that. And anybody with any reasonable ability at all, I think we covered it pretty, pretty well. Uh, the, other, the other point I wanted to remind everybody of is I think on uh, December 10th, Thursday, there's going to be a community forum. Uh, Rick Brazil is coming to do uh, talk to the community. It's not for the police to be involved in it. I talk to the community about the uh, situation up there in Thurston and their perception of the relations with the police. And I'm not exactly sure the specifics of it but you're welcome to be part of that i mean anybody in the, in the community is welcome to be part of that and so just giving you a heads up of where that is i'm assuming you can probably find that on the city's website uh, if it specifically look there so and jack that's all i have so it's uh, you know turn it over to you for business from the committee well i think that's time now for us now to uh, elect a new chair and co-chair for this uh, next coming time period that we are no, normally change offices. Jack, do you want to do that now or do you want to do that in January? Don't matter to me. We could do it now with it take effect in January. But I just think it's getting a little bit tight on time and that might take a little bit. It gives people a chance to kind of think about it. Maybe. I would like to wait for the minority new member to yeah. be here and then be inclusive and do it. Yeah, I agree. Well, in that, in that case, we can be a good idea also. We can just table it to our January meeting. 
Sounds good. We can vote for the new guy to be the chair. <laughs> it's not here. Well, does anybody, anyone have something, anything they want to share with the committee? I do real quick uh, in, in regards to uh, Mr. Brazil, on the very front face page of the Springfield website, at, it's towards the bottom under focus. There's uh, four items there, four large items on there, and you can click on it says forum with Rick Brazil, and it provides all that information right there on the first page of the website. All right. I'm, I'm assuming that'll be a virtual meeting on the 10th. Correct. We'll just be able to watch it. Okay. And and partake as a participant if you wish. I I think um that's kind of how it's set up. But it's it's right on this page right here. Okay. I'll look at that. Can I make one quick comment? Yes. Okay. It's okay. Okay. Uh, getting back to what Barry said, I totally agree. There's a lot of good information. I haven't had a chance to read it either, going back to what we just discussed. And uh, my feeling is listening to all the testimonies that we've had over the last month or two, there's a, a real disconnect in the citizens of Springfield and other places as far as that goes, and the police force. And there's a lot of assumptions going on that really bother me and my goal as this committee is to be a liaison to bring the citizens together with the police as far as i'm concerned our police force is second none. i've done right alongs i've been involved with the city for 15 years with planning commission city council everything and um, i just feel like that's something i i just hate hearing assumptions being made they're just flat out i just feel there's really no backing background to it, really. So my goal is to get the citizens and the police really understanding each other a lot better, and they'll feel like feel like I do about our police. You know, I want to support the police as much as possible, but I just want to help the citizens learn more and uh, bridge that gap. That's all I got to say. One, th one way you could look at it in the future that will will help the police force like that. The next time we have an open house, volunteer and take part in it and uh, talk to the people out there because that's one of the best chances that you and I and other people on the committee have to talk to the general public, all right, all ages and everything else. Because I've seen where the little kids they like the police cars majority but if a member in the family's had a bad experience those little kids they won't come near an officer or one of the police cars and that's one way where we as volunteers can help show that we've got a good department here all departments can take have some change for the better in some oh, places yeah but this is one way that we as individuals that were not committed other than personally for what we uh, can do to help uh, educate the citizens of uh, Springfield. I don't care about Eugene or someplace else. I'm concerned with the people right here. That's all I got yeah. to say on that. That's good. Thanks. Yeah. Agree. I have a comment to make. This is Issa. Uh, one thing I've noticed over the past month, especially, is the, I'm going to call it the stress uh, that people are experiencing for various reasons and how it's affecting their driving. I was almost hit twice today by people speeding, making quick moves, not paying attention. Um, so, Chief, can you, uh, I can call you later and talk to you about it, just make a brief statement about is Springfield doing any increased uh, traffic patrols um, to to look for these kind of people who aren't minding their P's and Q's? Well, the expectation is we're always out there looking for those, those individuals to do that. Uh, as far as increased staffing, unfortunately, right now our staffing is quite uh, quite a ways down. We're, we're running minimums most of the time just because of uh, 
retirements and vacancies that we have. And But if we have a specific area that the citizens are concerned about because they're having a repeated problem, please let us know. We do assign those to our traffic team, which is our motor okay. officers. And they do in turn, either they try to work that area or at least we can put out some of our, our speed signs and, and gather a little bit of data regarding that. It'll be interesting to kind of go back and look at 2020 and see, you know, did we have more crashes uh, than we have in the past uh, or less crashes? And I'm making the assumption it should be less in theory because I know that you, it, my insurance agency gave me a reduction on my, my, uh, my uh, car insurance just because the people aren't driving nearly as much as they have in the past and they're not experiencing mm -hmm. enough crashes but that doesn't mean people aren't getting a little bit antsy and and when they're out right. running around and so uh yeah you're welcome to give me a call lisa if there's a specific if it's happening in a specific area uh, or you were just unfortunately you know you happen to run across two individuals that were going out there and this happens every day we do get you know reckless drivers calls that's a, kind of a routine call for service that we get and we do we one do. is the pun it's especially on my radar because of my profession so i'm traveling back and forth between eugene springfield all day long five days a week um on m m lots of times the same roads but different roads and so i'm definitely seeing it in our area that people are i i can't explain it uh i mean i'm not inside their cars or their heads but i'm seeing some ridiculous driving occurring on a regular basis so that's what makes me think it's a societal issue, potentially people stress, people in a hurry, but thanks for commenting, Chief. You bet. One thing I'd like to mention for the Chief, so he can kind of fold it, put it away for uh, the future for the officers. Uh, they are installing a new uh, crosswalk on 21st Street for with flashing lights, uh, pedestrian activated for kids or people to cross 21st Street because of it's a thoroughfare. And right now they're just about at the point that uh, they're going to turn lights on, finish turning the wiring on it, turn the lights on on a trial basis tomorrow or the next day. But they probably won't put the crosswalk in until they have dry enough weather to paint a, the crosswalk in there. And that's right at uh, just north of uh, H Street on 21st. Okay. Hopefully, when uh, they when it's first activated, and anytime there's a chance for an officer to kind of watch and see if uh, the kids are, are are do crossing safely, and also if the public is respecting that flashing stoplight. And I more think that's more. the last thing I got for the evening. Thank you, Jack. Anybody else? Uh, information shared? Does anybody have any information shared? I'll go. Uh, so just wanted to mention that uh, Alan Klein, our park ranger, has uh, made some connections with the new school resource officer. So I really appreciate having that connection. and continuing to coordinate well with uh, all the patrol officers at the Springfield Police Department and his duties as he's out and about in the field uh, day to day. Um, did want to share, uh, we have noticed, unfortunately, a, a rash of um, car break-ins at you know, several of our trailhead facilities in the last month or so. And um, we do have uh, some video footage of suspect vehicle and we've been sharing that with um, SPD as well and trying to track down um, those individuals so uh, just in case you know, those of you on the committee if you're hearing about that activity out in the community please feel free to reach out to me and or the police department and we'll do our best we can to safeguard people but definitely um, uh, I'm unfortunate and disheartening to have that happening at our trailheads. And we're looking at ways that we can try to educate people as, as they're parking their vehicles there without um, scaring them unnecessarily. 
Hey, Eric, thanks. And, and uh, your park ranger is doing a good job. Uh, I have seen some emails back and forth where the sharing of videos and stuff. And some of the individuals that, uh, in fact, I was just talking about this today. One of the individuals that uh, he shared with us is somebody who who is not necessarily uh, such a problem regarding theft, but it just is kind of a dangerous individual we've dealt with over the time. And so uh, he is doing a good job of making contact with our officers and our officers getting used to working with him. And I think that's going to be a, a big plus. And I'll remind our officers to be checking the trailheads, uh, make sure they're making drive-bys and their appearance up in those areas. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, Chief. It's uh, one of those things where we can't be in all places at all times. And um, I think we do actually get really good coverage from the patrol officers uh, at a variety of our sites. And he's, he's seeing them there on, on a regular basis. And uh, people are just being... The individuals that we think are involved uh, that we've seen on video, <clears throat> quite frankly, is very brazen. I mean, just broad daylight, you know, completely in public view, sometimes with other people parking in the lot in their cars and they're, they're doing these break ins. So, just really astonishing. We know with with the, all the new technology now and the cameras, and people have the ring camera at their house. We get a lot of these um, cases, and the brazenness of, of individuals is kind of stunning sometimes. And you just see people nonchalantly walk up and they're just trying car doors, uh, people's, you know, in people's driveways. And uh, it's it, it's too bad that that happens, but uh, it is the video is very powerful and really helps us because. Most of our officers uh, who are out there working the street will look at those pictures and typically they'll know the individual pretty quickly. Anybody else? I just wondered, did you guys uh, enhance your communication or does Alan have good communications or quick communications with SPD yet, Eric, or is that something that still you guys are working on? Uh, I'm at SPD. Question. Yeah. Great question. Uh, we did uh, talk with Lieutenant Crawley about that. Oh gosh, a couple months, couple months back, um, fairly soon after Alan started with us. Um, admittedly, with everything that's been going on with COVID and you know other other priorities, it, it's probably fallen off the radar. Um, but I do feel as though he does have great support and you know, good lines of communication established otherwise. Um, has access to you know, patrol staff, um, uh, shift sergeants you know, when he needs them. So whether or not we need to have that, you know, that direct link to the radio communication doesn't necessarily feel like that's necessary at this point. Yeah, and it just comes to mind when I'm thinking about that type of behavior and and Chief, you know it, and Eric, you recognize it too. And, and of course, everybody sitting here also recognizes that the level of behavior um, and the dangerousness of the behavior of people that are committing crimes is not getting better. It's going the other direction, and in that I get a, I have a lot of concern for um, his his park ranger, his safety, and that that if there's anything from the city's end of things that we can do to help enhance that safety, then I think we should work that direction. I agree. Anybody else? Anything else? Hey, this has been great, you guys. Jack, I think you, you, you're the boss, so you need to tell us that we're done. If, if, if you well, think I think it's time for us to adjourn, and that's about uh, 25 minutes to 8. All right. I All think right. we had a pretty good meeting tonight. Right. Thanks, everybody. Have Have a Merry Christmas. Thanks, Jack. Have, Have a Merry Christmas, everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Merry Christmas to you. Yeah. <laughs>